so where I really want to start is like early life. Because when I looked at your LinkedIn, when we were first preparing for the episode, like yeah. the, the original podcast episode, yeah. I just couldn't figure out why you're doing anything with manufacturing because I'm reading like software, 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 like yeah. very software centric yeah. person, yeah, yeah. study computer science. And then we were listening to, I forgot which podcast episode it yeah, was yeah. you did. You're like, actually, I went to boarding school yeah. where it was like very manufacturing focused. Yes. And I'm like, ah, that's yeah. that's where the seed might have been planted. Yep. So let's start there. Talk about that boarding school, the experience, how you got into it. Yeah, so I, I went to, to an all boys school. Um, yeah, we had a lot of focus. It was a small school. I think we had a class of 60 people. Nice. Um, so there was a lot of focus on kind of like all around curriculum, right? You know, from academics, academic uh, curriculum, but also a lot of like hands-on stuff. So, you know, we had shop from very, very early on. I think we started shopping um, kind of like toward the end of uh, elementary school. Nice. Um, so it started with like carpentry, working with wood, like softer material, um, and then I think when we got into, when we went to high school, started working more with like metals, um, initially just like work with the plate, cut it into shapes, grind it, manually polish it, sand it, you know, kind of make like, I don't know, like a bottle opener out of it, right? Like something simple. And then people would start getting creative with projects. That's like, you know, as we got toward the end of the high school. Um, and that's, uh, where I started kind of do some welding, some sheet shaping, um, so I always had that in my background, but, you know, computers were always just fascinating, right? You always have this world where, at least when I was in school, it's like, you know, it was just, everything was possible, right? Whereas with physical world, there was always limitations, right? Um, so as I, you know, as I went to school, I got more interested or even toward the end of the high school, I got more interested in programming, um, and, and I kind of went toward that way, but I kept that hobby of making things. Uh, even though I was doing a lot of software stuff, right? You know, I worked a little bit at a shop in, in Pomona. Um, uh, Bobby Walden, I don't know if you guys know him, but he's like a very famous sheet shaper gotcha. making like, you know, 1930s Fords um, and hot rods, kind of restoring them cool. and making them from scratch. So, cool. you know, spent some time in that shop. Actually, when we started this company, uh, one of the first early team activities was take everybody, the I early team, to that shop. Everybody made a bowl um, out of it. Um, and, and kind of like just getting to know like how you actually get a sheet to form in a, in a, in a complex shape just with hand. Yeah. Um, and that gives you a lot of good intuition and why this process can be actually automated. You know, it's one of those processes where you spend some time, you learn the skill by just re learning the patterns of what you do. And then, um, and then it's very, and then you can kind of see how it's, it's relatively under intuitive to make it automated. Um, um, anyway, so yeah, manufacturing was always in my background as a passion. Um, and when I started, when I got a job offer from SpaceX, that was good. Even though I went there as a software engineer, it was a good opportunity to kind of combine both. I work on some of the manufacturing processes we had uh, from our vertical lift machines, but all the way to like friction steel welding machines. Um, so that's when I started to combine it a little bit. Um, and then obviously when I went to relativity, even though, again, my role was robotic and software, we were building a 3D printer, right? And eventually I was in charge of that 3D printer. So um, there seemed to be a lot of software, but always had like some kind of a connection to the hardware um, and manufacturing. I want to kind of jump back to where you're talking about going to SpaceX. I, in our research, we came across that it looked like you were offered like almost two times as much pay to join Google at a similar time. Yeah. I'd be interested in understanding why you wanted to join SpaceX. Was that related to what you're talking about, this intersection yes. of software and manufacturing, or was there more that went to it? Yeah, no, I think, yeah, an intersection of software and manufacturing is a big part of it, right? Um, I remember I was uh, interning at Google, and if I would have gone back to Google at a time, it would have gotten too much twice just the amount that I would get at at um, at, uh, at SpaceX. But SpaceX yeah. just sounded more exciting, right? And this is like 2012, 2013, when engineering team was still pretty small mm -hmm. um, compared to now. Um, there was only like a handful of flights, like four or five flights that were successful. And they were like, you can come here, you can kind of like be flexible to choose to what you're working on. Your work is going to directly affect, you know, the vehicle or our manufacturing processes. So yeah, having that ability to work on these things that are closer to hardware um, was very exciting to me. And that's why, yeah, I, I chose kind of lower salary to go there. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, well, one thing I was going to ask. When you went to college, you know, you decided to go down the computer science path, right? Mm -hmm. But you also studied business administration. Mm -hmm. Did you know from like an early stage that you wanted to have something of your own, a business of your own? 
or was that just like, hey, you know, like I'm here, mm -hmm. I like engineering, let's just get some business knowledge while we're at it. If yeah. anything comes of it, great. If not, whatever. Yeah, no, I think I never had that kind of burning desire to like be an entrepreneur mm -hmm. or build something like a company, right? I always was interested in, in, in projects and solving problems. There were certain problems that I was more interested in. And if I could join a company that was solving that problem, then I was excited to do it there. Um, uh, and I think entrepreneurship was more of a path to like, oh, nobody else is solving this problem. Somebody got to do it. So let's 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 put a team together and you know take a shot at it. Um, business was, I don't know. I think I started getting well. My dad, you know, he was in the business world and he got his MBA. My sister as well. So I always was like kind of exposed to to the concepts. And I really, um, I think I was excited from the perspective of like kind of like how do you organize a team to kind of do something. Yeah. So it was not like oh I want to become a business person, but I, I really like organizational behavior. Like, uh, I really like it's your strategy classes on how do you go about solving some problem that requires a group of people. Um, and it's a very complex environment where you have customers and people are involved. Um, so that, that excited me. So it was mostly just like, just learn about it more. I ended up becoming a major. Um, but, uh, but yeah, never thought about it. I was like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go into business. Yeah. Continuing down this rabbit hole of like your early life and how it prepared you for this awesome company you've got going today. I'm curious, you mentioned your your dad had a business background. I know your mm -hmm. sister's an entrepreneur as well. Is there anything about like the way you guys were raised around the house or like the upbringing that you had that made it really conducive for you and your sister to both become entrepreneurs? Or is it something that like you kind of just stumbled upon out of this burning passion to be solving big problems? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I think we were exposed. So my dad would also like, you know, start a couple of companies. Cool. So it was, there was always... Um, I think the biggest thing to starting companies is like not having the fear to start something and not know what's going to happen. So I think that was something that when we were earlier in our childhood, that like, you know, I think our parents and my dad, my dad like really instilled in us. Um, but I don't think there was any push toward that. Like my other sister, she's a doctor, right? Like she went completely down a professional route, you know, so they're very different than us. And my mom is a chemistry teacher. So, so not somebody who ever did like anything too risky or, um, you know, went down a profession that like that she liked and it was very defined and nine to five, right? Well, I've been in a um, chemistry classroom. That's also, there's some inherent risk there with that's right. kids and chemicals, but that's yeah, right. I understand. That's right. um, yeah, so I think there's definitely like, you know, I think that the, 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 my dad had a, had a role in kind of how we thought about problems, both me and my sister, but um, but never was like pushed that way because, because of it. Gotcha. Now, uh, one last question about college. Uh, you started your undergrad in 2004 mm -hmm. and you finished in 2012. Yeah. So during that eight year period, you kept taking breaks to work at like, you know, Google and some other companies. Right. I'm, I'm curious why, like, were you just so like thirsty to get your hands on something and you just yeah. couldn't do with the classroom anymore? You seem like that kind of guy. You yeah. seem like you like to get your hands dirty. Yeah. I think that was one piece that like, you know, my dad was always upset about because I always like was a little bit rebellious. Um, you know, I always thought, okay, school is good as long as we're building towards something that's going to be a problem that's exciting to solve, right? right? So every time I had opportunity during the school to be like, you know, I went and did an internship and um, and then like, you know, the people I work with said, okay, this is a cool problem. Seems like, you you know, you really like it. Do you want to stay longer? And I was like, okay, this sounds more exciting than going back and learning a subject at school. So so I ended up doing that a lot. You know, I stayed at Microsoft for a little bit, worked at a startup for a little bit, went to Google for a little bit. Um, every time I had an opportunity to get hands-on experience and it was an exciting problem, um, I definitely kind of chose that. But then after a while, I realized I still need to learn more stuff and school is a good opportunity to do that. So I ended up going back. Okay. Um, until I didn't feel that way, right? You know, I was like, okay. And when I would SpaceX, I was like, okay, no, I think... And also like things changed. Now there's like all the stuff was online. You can learn a lot of stuff. So I was like, you don't really need to go back to school to learn it. You can learn it on your own, right? Um, but yeah, I think I always thought of school as a mean to an end, not just like, oh, like you go through stages, like finish the school, then you find a job and then you do the next thing. It's more like, what do you want to do? Do the things you need to do to get that done. And but that partially might be going to school. Right. Did you ever consider dropping out, like just not doing school because, you, like you're saying, resources became available, yeah. you had all these opportunities? Yeah, I did. I think a lot of times, every time I went into those internships, there was like opportunities like, can I just continue this? 
or go back to school. There's a lot of cool stuff that happened at school too. Like I, you know, met a lot of good professors, advisors. Right. Um, so yes, I thought about it, but always like had, I didn't finish the major because I thought I have to definitely finish it. It was more like there was a still more exciting stuff to do at school. That's why I've been back. Awesome. Awesome. Now go going into SpaceX, um, one of the things I heard you talking about, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that might have planted the seed for Machina. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that, I think I was on the Falcon Heavy. Right. The engine couldn't get bigger. It could only get taller because of the uh, limitations you had with the manufacturing floor. Yeah. It was it, in Falcon 9. Yes. Falcon 9. Yeah. Gotcha. So is that like, you were obviously doing software stuff, but you were working on the manufacturing side as well. Is that where the idea of this manufacturing approach might not be the best? We need an alternative comes to your mind? I think that's where I got exposed to like, what is the main challenge of manufacturing, gotcha. right? Um, the Falcon 9, as you said it, you know, the tooling that went into building the tank and that vehicle was very static. These are the tools that you have to build to either like, you know, wrap composites or do whatever you need to do to build the vehicle. And that tooling is usually very expensive. And your shop floor, even to the point that your shop floor and flow of materials very dependent on the geometry of your the thing that you're trying to build and the material you're trying to build. Right. So every time you want to change that, you want to go slightly, maybe larger in diameter, almost you have to think about building a new factory, right? And that's a huge limitation if you think about it, right? Like, you know, once you made a choice on a design, on a diameter of the vehicle, you are done. Like, you better make that work, right? Yeah. And, and it's not easy to go back and change it. Um, so there was a lot of decision points at SpaceX. I remember when, when I was there, there was a lot of fights around, like we we're running out of space in Falcon 9 on putting things. Um, and it becoming very crowded to where put things, right? And, 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 and people were fighting over like what to keep, what to get rid of. The vehicle kept getting taller because they wanted to increase the capacity of the tank so to go to higher orbits. Um, but it was just impossible to get it larger in diameter. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think with, with uh, Starship now, they're starting from scratch in Texas, different facility, different type of tooling. It doesn't necessarily, the Falcon 9 tooling obviously doesn't work for, for Starship. Um, so I think that's what started seeing some of the challenges. That's what got me excited about 3D printing because 3D printing at that point was like this tool-less kind of like, you know, miracle, right? Like you can kind of build anything out of any material. You don't have to commit to any specific tooling. Um, and that's why I got excited joining uh, Relativity after SpaceX. Um, but yeah, I think that's where we saw the challenge, right? It's very hard to change your design. And if you're like an engineer coming out of school, it's very discouraging because that means like you can only go to those companies, work on one product for six, seven years, and that product better work. And then you kind of like walk yourself into corners and you have to kind of figure out how to get out of it because you can't easily change your design. Uh, so it's very limiting. I think it's core of a lot of problems in manufacturing, not just design iteration, lots of other problems also, like I, th I think downstream from the fact that you can't change your factories right. easily. Yeah. Right. So, you know, additive manufacturing, it seems like this silver bullet of yeah. like manufacturing, right? Um, but we've seen a bunch of different industries adopt it. Yep. I was going to ask you why you joined Relativity, but you know, yeah. you already alluded to it. Um, do you think additive has a strong future in the aerospace realm? Like, is it a solution that's going to scale? Yeah. I think, I mean, additive is great. I mean, I come from additive, so I'm biased. I love additive, right? I think additive manufacturing, you know, in a lot of applications delivers on that promise of like, you can easily change your design. I, for example, I think rocket engines, probably no rocket engine in the future will be manufactured any other way. Really? I think. I think we'll go okay. toward that way. It's a lot of internal features. Anything that looks like a heat exchanger where you have a lot of internal features. Um, I think additive is just the route to go, right? Um, I mean, think about traditionally how like they had to machine every inlet and it's a huge, you know, really, co really cost intensive process to do it any other way. So additive, I think it will win in that application. Um, there are applications like, you know, everybody knows Invisalign, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect fit for, for additive, right? Yeah. Um, mass customization, it's much cheaper. So like additive, I think is going to, it's a very, 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 very strong tool. But the way I think about it is just one of the tools in your tool belt. Right, I think for a while when additive came about, everybody thought, okay, that's the key to automation. Like everything needs to be manufactured additively. I don't think that is the case. I think additive a certain reach. The reach is rather limited, proved to be a little bit limited in terms of the type of parts it can do. Obviously, a lot of smart folks are working on kind of expanding that reach and adding new material, new types of geometries, larger envelopes. But at the end of the day, I mean, like all these years has gone by. I mean, additive industry is around sixteen billion dollar 
industry, right? Right. And when you compare it to sheet metal, for example, sheet metal is $250 billion industry. Like, so like you kind of see the reach of the parts are still very limited. So I think we need to start thinking about it more holistically. How can we use all these tools and develop more agile tools like additive that can reach to other types of parts and then create a factory platform that can use these different tools like a, like a craftsman picks up another tool. Like you use a drill and they're like, I'm done with the drill. Drill is not going to solve all of my problems. Now I need to pick up a welder and weld, mm -hmm. right? I think we need to start thinking about it a little bit more in terms of system and a platform and, and in develops other operations that are as agile as additive and then combine them together if you want to think about the future of manufacturing. So you're talking about like a dynamic manufacturing platform versus the static, which has been the norm. Yes. Now, my, my one pushback on this, I have very limited knowledge of the aerospace sector, so I'm just mm -hmm. letting you know. But what I know about mm -hmm. aerospace companies, they're typically pretty risk adverse and um, from what I've heard, there's a bit of friction trying to get them to adapt to new things. Yes. Um, that That's kind of, I guess, my main reservation when it comes to additive. Like, are all these companies, at least the ones you're working with, open to like incorporating more additive parts? Or are they still kind of waiting to see how it plays out, get more data, more reliability? Like, where do you think their head is at? Yeah, on the additive side, it has been very difficult. I think that was one of the reasons also, like, I went to sheet metal with this company. Interesting. Um, additive <clears throat> fundamentally is a different process than the alternatives. The alternative may be machining or casting. Um, and additive, like on the physics level, is very different. Like, you know, you're kind of smelting and solidifying very incrementally. And that creates a lot of issues like prosody cracking. That, and, that, and a lot of the parts that are kind of candidate for additive are also very... Uh, important mission critical parts, right? Like a rocket engine you're thinking right. about, right? So the the bar of accepting a new process is really high. So I think there are like a bunch of things that's not working for additive in that sense, where they went after really critical parts and the process is very different physically from the traditional process. So it's very hard to qualify it um, and sh make sure that, okay, this is going to be great and the same as the other process we did for 30 years, uh, especially if it's on a safety... Uh, critical applications like aviation, right? Where like people and lives are in danger. Um, so I think additive, the one biggest challenge with additive is finding the applications that, that makes the most sense. Maybe they're not as critical, but then they're still very important. Additive can bring a lot of value there. Um, I think that's the dance that, you know, a lot of these additive companies and us as well went into. And I think also like you will see that a lot of companies on that world that in the additive world that are vertically integrating. Like for example, I think that's one thing I appreciate about Relativity Space was like, it's very hard to replace one part in a traditional company, but you can design for additive from scratch and account for all its challenges. As long as you can kind of think about the scope of the problem as the whole vehicle, not just one part. Right. So that gives you more flexibility or application like Invisalign where like, okay, just go end to end, find a business solution that end to end additive can help. Um, I think those has been like the most successful cases, but yeah, that's the challenge. I think people are slowly building those specifications, getting there, but it has been slow. It's been very slow. Gotcha. Yeah. I think we're progressing really well along your career story. We've gotten through SpaceX. We've got the relativity. What came between relativity and the founding of Machina? What, what, um, I'm just kind of interested in understanding the story, maybe how you met your co-founder, yep. how the team came together and what your thoughts were around Hey, let's go from additively manufacturing rocket engines to let's use robots to form sheet metal. What what brought your mind from point A to point B and kind of take us along the, the ride, so to speak, of yeah. how that happened? So one big thing I realized when I was at Relativity, I was really excited about additive. I'm still very excited about additive. And we kind of talked about this a little bit, is that the reach of additive proved to be very limited, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are certain type of parts, like rocket engines, good fit. But then you start, for example, adding a thin wall structure tanks, then it becomes really tough um, because you go through that solidification melting process. There are all kinds of stresses that are induced in the part, um, makes it really not the perfect fit for additive process. So when I was at, at Relativity, I started thinking about what are, how can we kind of increase this reach of this type of agile process to other material and other types of geometries? Um, uh, that's actually where I met my co-founder, Bobak. Bobak is a, is a material scientist. He was helping us at Relativity Space develop alloys for the 3D printing gotcha. process. And his extensive background, you know, he helped 
he was at, at sheet uh, at a uh, um, uh, um, sheet product company called Novellus. They right. make they they make sheet metal parts um, or sheet metal flat roll parts um, for automotive industry and aerospace. Um, so has extensive background. He's like I said, I said he's a PhD in material science, um, and uh, we both have the same kind of like annoyance with additive, which was like additive is great, but like the reach is limited. What are the type of things we can do? What are the type of technologies we can develop to kind of bring the same type of benefit additive has in terms of agility to other processes? I started working with some of the academics we knew, uh, folks from Northwestern and others. I started looking at some of the other candidates. A sheet for metal forming came out. Actually, like what we do here, um, we have to give credit. A lot of people have been working on this before us, right? You know, um, for example, Jian Chao, who's who one of our advisors. You know, has been working on a similar systems for the past 30 years. How can you incrementally deform a sheet into shape? And we started kind of identifying that the, the pieces that makes that commercialized exist today. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, the robotic piece and artificial intelligence. Um, and we realized added, like for example, sheet metal compared to additive is much larger industry, so we can have a much bigger impact. Um, um, but really the thinking was, how can we build the platform that can eventually use additive and develop other agile processes that this platform can use to really move on to the next generation of manufacturing floors, not through just one process, but through a platform, right? And, and the thinking was like, basically how do you replicate what a craftsman used to do, like you know a blacksmith used to do, because they're super flexible. They can pick up different tools, apply it differently to the material, make all kinds of different parts out of different material, um, but they just didn't have a lot of throughput. So how can we take that paradigm and kind of add a scale to it. So that was the thinking behind behind um, behind Machina when we started. You know, it's fu it's funny you mentioned academia. When our episode went live, one of our listeners reached out and they shared a video from a couple years ago. Um, I think was it NASA? NASA research. Yeah, NASA research that they were doing something like this, but at a smaller scale, mm -hmm. and I think with a single robotic arm versus two. Yeah. So they were like, "Hey, like, there's this also available. Like, what are the differences between what's already being done and what these guys are doing?" Yeah. And uh, I think you kind of touched on it. I'm probably going to go dive a little bit deeper with the right. AI and the two arms working together. So that's really interesting. Yeah, I think a lot of people, like I said, like you know, this is in. Uh, physical world, usually you find a lot of legacy of people having been doing similar things uh, in the past. So, yeah, have, people have been taking similar approaches. Like some of those people are advisors. I think Ford has been working on this concept for a while. We've had Boeing working on this for a while. I think they all missed a key ingredient to make it commercialized. Like, you know, and the key ingredient is like, how can you make the system cheap? But also, most importantly, how can you make sure you can make accurate parts? Right? You know, like with one robot, you mentioned, you go in there and you can kind of imagine you guys have mechanical background. You push a sheet of metal from one side. The whole thing deforms in one direction, right? The part ends up being like inches off of your geometry, right? So if you just do something simple like, oh, just form it in water lines, right? So the key was like, how do we, what are the missing pieces so that we can make a part that's like, you know, plus minus one millimeter accurate on an envelope of 12 foot by five foot? Um, I think those are the things that like, you know, you can see something that looks like this, but really comes down to the intelligence of the process and what are the missing pieces that can make a usable part. So let's get into that. In, in our podcast, we call that the secret sauce, yeah. right? So what is the magic to your secret sauce that gives you that plus or minus one millimeter accuracy? Yeah. So I think the key came from, you know, like when I was doing sheet shaping, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, it's funny, like you don't, when you're forming a sheet of metal, you don't necessarily hammer it in the most intuitive way. You actually, it's like the way you hammer it to get it to the geometry is very non-intuitive. You almost look like you're forming something else and then the end, you get the right part. And that's the key, right? The key is like if I'm forming a part, because once I'm like starting applying forces to the sheet, the part moves in all kinds of different way globally. Um, the sheet has some type of a spring back. It kind of, it, it, it is like, it's elastic a little bit. Like you push it and you come back, it just jumps back in, right? So you need to almost figure out what do you need to hammer this part into that by the end, it kind of jumps back into the right shape with all the stresses and movements in the part. Um, so that's the key, key enabler of making accurate parts. So what we ended up doing is like, we had to make a platform that allows us to gather data, like a craftsman that's looking at the part, gather data at every step of the way. 
What is the force that I'm applying to the part? How does the part look like at each point in time? So can we start using this data to build models and say, okay, if I do this path, the final part will look like this. And then once I have a very good model of like saying, okay, I'm doing this path, the final part will look like this. I can inverse that model and say, okay, if I use, if I want this part, what is the right set of process parameters I need to start with to get to that right part? So you're almost trying to re invert, re inver, uh, uh, kind of reverse engineer what's happening in mind of the craftsman, gotcha, gotcha. right? Um, and that's that's a lot of like data gathering. You need to build a platform that allows you to capture the data, but then also use that data to do modeling um, to figure out exactly what to form to get the right part. So it's like this iterative process where you have, you know, this robotic solution applying forces, a bunch of sensors gathering data, and then you have the outcome of that process. So mm -hmm. now you feed it into a model. And that model is now able to give you feedback of right. if you want this end product, you need to have certain parameters modified to be X, Y, and Z. Exactly. Is, is that a good summary of it? That's a, that's a good summary of it. And the thing, the key was in the past, people, like if you look at our advisors, they've been using physics-based simulation to kind of come up with the right way of forming a part, that by the end, it's the right part. The problem with the physics-based simulations, you guys probably know, like FEA or CFD, they're not accurate. Yeah. But also they take a long time. Actually, we realize in a 32 core machine, if you simulate a part that takes 15 minutes, it takes one week. <laughs> so you might, as, so like, so we were like, okay, maybe that's not the right approach. Maybe we need to start creating a system that allows us to capture the data every step of the way and then use empirical modeling as opposed to physics-based simulations. Um, I think that's one of the key enablers, but also creates a mode for us. The more parts we form, the more data we have, the more we are able, and solely we are able, to come up with the right process parameters right. for that alloy and that type of geometry. I, I like, it's kind of a full circle talking about like when you were working at that hot rod shop and then you also took the team there to do their two-day apprenticeship. Like the best way to learn to form sheet metal physically by hand is just yes. actually doing it and learning from someone that knows how. You've, you've almost built... A machine in some sorts you know this whole business with the artificial intelligence r related to it that is learning how to show how to shape sheet metal by hand you know by doing it itself right. and then learning from that do you see any parallels between no, exactly like, the i think that was apprenticeship? that was exactly what you brought up that was the point right like it's very experiential and it's funny it's similar to how the experience is very similar to some of the other AI ML problems, right? A sheet shaper, after a while, knows exactly how to hammer a sheet of metal to get in shape. But you explain, why are you doing that? And they'd be like, they explain you in a very non, like kind of weird, almost magical way. I was like, well, I mean, if I, if I do this, the part will deform a different way in the other end. And then eventually we'll get to the right place. And... Uh, so it's like very hard to know unless you actually start doing it and you're like, oh, now I get it, uh, right? It's the same way how like, for example, like you look at an image of a dog uh, and I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll get to why I'm making this analogy. <laughs> look at an image of a dog and you say, oh, that looks like a dog and the other one looks like a cat. Well, they can't really explain why you're saying this is a dog and that's a cat. You just, in your mind, looking at a lot of images, you figured out how to differentiate between these two. There's some neural path in your brain that differentiates between the dog and a cat. Um, and it's, I think the same same thing happens when you're sheet forming. At some point, you know how to form a sheet. It just clicks. But like you can't really explain it. Yeah. So the idea is if you expose enough data, the same way we automated using AI, ML, and neural networks, how you, you differentiate between cat and a dog, and that's already a solved problem in, a, in the AI world. Can you, if you feed enough data of forming material to a system, can they then figure out how to form the right, right part, right? Same, exactly what you said, right? That, that was the motivation, yeah. I think that's awesome. And I love, I love how we can see, you know, walking the way through your journey, we can see all of this different experiences come together to form something that's really awesome in a, in a way that, you know, we call it the secret sauce. We're wearing t-shirts that say it on there, but you know, the different ingredients that you've picked up throughout your experience in life that formed this really unique secret sauce that only Machina has that makes your team best positioned in the world to attack this problem. I think yeah. it's cool. I think that was one of the challenges like probably like companies like Ford and others have. It's like, you need kind of unique backgrounds, right? That like traditional like hardware companies didn't have, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that has been that has been some of the challenge like for folks like Boeing or Ford who have been doing a lot of research on this didn't get it to the point where it can actually form accurate parts that's usable for them. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think that's kind of to me that's the definition of creativity. You kind of combine a bunch of different seemingly unrelated concepts together to create something new, right? And it's it's funny because I think you or someone just like you who has the background that you have, which is very extensive experience in, you know, software and ML, 
And then also the passion for manufacturing. Like I've seen you talk about it um, throughout your different interviews. It's not like a means to an end to you. You're talking about it like it's art, like it's this beautiful process. Mm -hmm. So someone that has that drive and that knowledge and knows that problem firsthand, I think you were perfectly situated, especially with your uh, co-founder who had the materials background mm -hmm. to tackle a problem like this. So it's awesome to see. And what I want to ask you now is obviously we have this amazing secret sauce that you guys have been working on. We, we've seen the products. They work great. Um, you talked about, you know, how you're getting this amazing accuracy, one, one millimeter plus or minus. Now I'm interested in the impact of what you've developed, right? Mm -hmm. Like what it means for those end consumers. Our listeners, some of them have a tech background, some of them don't. How does that one millimeter accuracy compare to what the industry needs or this industry yeah. norm? So traditionally with sheet metal parts, um, usually the, the accuracy expressed relative to the size of the part, mm -hmm. right? The larger the part is, uh, usually like the less accurate it can be or it has been. Because the traditional technique is like a die, right? Like so you have you stamp it against the die and the sheet moves in all kinds of weird way under the die until you get to the final part. So the best type of accuracies, um, automotive has it. Automotive is like, I'll call them the king of sheet metal, right? Like they have perfected this, right? Um, there's a lot we're learning from them. Um, you know, I think they can get to plus minus half a millimeter is on a smaller parts. Like, you know, I remember like we we're working with somebody on a fender or um, on a wheel well. Um, that's kind of the type of accuracies they're trying to get, um, plus minus half a millimeter. On some of the external parts, there are other requirements in terms of like, you know, class A parts, they call it like the, that need to like, has a very smooth curve that like, you know, the right lift rakes right off of it in a right way. Um, but half a millimeter is kind of the best um, kind of accuracy you can get. Gotcha. Um, but, uh, but you know, then with larger parts, it's much, much tougher. Like usually they, like I said, they talk about it as a percentage of the largest length. Uh, with us, it's absolute because the it comes down to basically the, our limitation to accuracy is how much can we measure actually today. Our system, because the same robot scans, our, our system right now cannot measure beyond plus minus one millimeter. So the moment we can measure, then we can command the robots to kind of actually affect that measurement. Um, um, so our theoretical limit is below half a millimeter. We can, you know, the robots are repeatable usually within 0.2. Some robots are 0 0.8, 0 0.08, 0 so much more accurate than that. Um, but the limit right now have been um, the uh, the measurement, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of maybe they didn't answer you exactly, but I think the best type of accuracy is out there is half a, half a millimeter. No, that, that's great. That's, yeah. that's, you know, a comparison for them. Now, yeah. I'm, I'm going to ask, is... Were, were you, did you have like an accuracy in mind and that's what led you to pick the robots you did? Obviously, you know, there's a, a bunch of different robots that can all generally do the same types of tasks, but most of what we saw today were KUKA robots. Yes. So I'm wondering like, what was the driver behind making those decisions? Yeah. So one of the things that when we started building the system was how can we make it cost effective? Right. Um, traditional experiments, you mentioned NASA and talked about Ford and others, um, they built systems that were specifically built for this application. Um, and if you actually think about it, probably there are other systems that are more suitable mechanically to do this part, this, this process, because we're applying really high forces. So some of these sheets that we are forming, if they're very thick, we're looking at 20,000 newtons of force, right? Like, you know, wow. weight of a truck on a very small kind of like tip of a tool, yeah. right? Um, so, so the robots actually wind up having the robots deflect. Right, because they're articulated um, and they're not very stiff. Um, right, so a lot of folks who did this before they went with gantry design that are more, usually more more stiff. But when we wanted to do it, we wanted to first make sure we can reduce the cost. So we want to, as much as we can, use off the shelf systems. Right, something that has been commoditized. Right, so the cost is low, and then start thinking about how can we account for their deficiencies through software. Can we make an infinitely stiff robot? And that what that meant was that, okay, you need to use a robotic system. That means you cannot use any of their control systems because they're not built for this application. So we had to start building the control systems from scratch ourselves and then start accounting for the load. Like not only we need to account for kinematics of the robot moving in the space to be accurate, but also under load, they might deflect for five millimeters. So depending on the load, characterize how much deflection we're gonna get in the robot and account for that in your kinematics. So those are the things that we thought, okay, through software we can build. And those are actually some of the robotic work that we were doing that almost cutting cutting edge, right? You know, getting these two robots to be accurate in an envelope of five 
foot by 12 foot, pinching a sheet that might be half a millimeter, applying 20,000 newtons of force, and it still moved really fast, that is something that we had to, from scratch, kind of start resolving and figure out how we're going to do on our robotic side. We cannot rely on the control system that comes with KUKA. But we wanted to use something from KUKA or FANUC because it's commoditized. Right, so the cost of the system, the, the hardware cost of the system comes becomes lower, and we can account for that for with with the with the with the software. The other piece was we wanted to build a system that is a platform. It doesn't just do sheet forming. If I would have gone with Yantry, maybe I could have made a very good sheet former. But then the moment, I, but but when you form a sheet, the next step you have to cut it, you have to trim it, you have to add slots to it, you have to make holes, or you have to hem the edges, you have to maybe surface finish it. So if I am not thinking about those future steps already, the benefit of making forming agile is very limited, right? Because then they need to set up another die process to press it and do holes and do punches and then do surface finishing, go to the traditional manufacturing. Actually, that was one of the problems the additive has. Like you can add it to the form, but if post-processing is still tool intensive, then you remove all the benefits that additive gave you. So we really wanted to use build a system that can be flexible, and that's why robots also were, was very important. Six axis or seven axis articulated robots allowed us to more easily also do cutting. After forming, pick up a laser and then cut. And then after that, drop it off, pick up a, a sanding uh, disc and then sand, right? So the our thought was also build a system that can be a platform and can use different processes and integrate different processes and not just be a sheet former. And I love the parallels you're drawing here. It reminds me when you're talking about a craftsman picking up the different tools. This is essentially what you've you've taught your robot forming cells to do, right. right? Right. Grab a full tool set, just like a craftsman would trying to form sheet metal. Um, do you see any parallels there between those two? Yeah, I mean that that is exactly the concept, right? The concept is like you know, not build another specific machine that just does one part of the process more agile, but then you have to integrate with the rest of the factory that is less agile. Can you build a robotic craftsman, right? A robotic system that can that it can easily add other operations to it. Maybe today we do only forming and trimming and scanning, but down the road you can pick up a welder and do additive. And then we can pick up a hemming head and hem the parts. Uh, and you can pick up a surface finishing head and surface finish. And now you have a facility that maybe have you have 200 of these cells in it, but you can program it to do all kinds of different parts, all kinds of different operations, like you go ahead and program a data center, right? So it becomes very agile that way. Um, so you really, we wanted to stay away from building custom specific machines. That was another thing that we learned from additive is that like you build an additive machine if you don't figure out the downstream processes. You only solve the problem halfway. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now I'm curious, like for most of the customers that you're working with, right? Could you give us a high level apples to apples comparison they're seeing going with your system versus the traditional manufacturing approach? Now it can be, you know, lead times, cost, whatever pain points that you're able to address. Yeah, I think there's like three main pain points mm -hmm. um, that we're addressing. So one of them is number one is usually lead time, mm -hmm. right? Um, our biggest customer is Department of Defense. Um, the main challenge they have is, I mean, think of think of yourself. Actually, if you look back in World War II, what made American defense and American defense um, infrastructure win World War II was our ability to manufacture. Our ability to manufacture a lot of tanks, a lot of artillery really fast. Now, since World War II, what ended up happening is we have become much more advanced. So we can make planes that are F, like F-35, it costs $100 million, but we can make them. They're really amazing, but we actually have very limited ability to repair them. It takes a long time when something breaks down to repair it. Um, there, are, there are cases, for example, right now we're talking with our Department of Defense, it takes four years when wow. something is broken to repair it. And it's also because you have this legacy of like 70, 80 years of assets. There are planes that we are flying that are from 60s still. Right, or right. 70s from still, right? And the vendor who made them is out of business. You know, the tools that were used are gone. Um, so, so I think being able to increase the agility there will directly affect fleet readiness in the case of conflict, right? If I send a plane out and it got damaged, landing gear good or got damaged, half has kind of replaced that. So it's become a huge strategic. Um, uh, importance for, for DOD, and that's one of our biggest customers. So that is turning four-year lead times into hours and months, uh, wow. uh, uh, as opposed to years. Um, so that's number one. 
And then I can imagine some of the more agile customers like SpaceX and others that also we were working with, it gives them ability to rapidly change over the designs, right? Traditionally, if you have to make a die, five months, we have to wait to make a die, stamp it. That's the fastest, usually three to five months, the fastest. Um, now you can kind of make a, make a part in a month or in, in hours after design in reality. Um, so that so lead time has been one of the biggest advantages. Um, the second biggest thing has been forming things that were traditionally not possible. Like we have this part in front of us. This is a this is titanium part. Mm -hmm. um, titanium is key alloy for like hypersonic applications, right? Once you start making a plane that can go really fast, the friction on the surface of the plane increases the temperature, right? So like you cannot make an aluminum alloy plane that can go hypersonic. Um, to start to have to use alloys like in canal titanium. The problem with these alloys is that traditionally they're not formable, right? For example, titanium, you need to elevate the temperature before you can form it. So it's very expensive to form these things. Um, so a lot of the other kind of like core problem we're solving is that because we have more control over the process, we are incrementally and locally deforming the sheet, we can really stretch and kind of like go push the material to its extent of formability right before it tears right so it allows us to form like things like titanium at room temperature that traditionally wasn't possible without a die so that's another group of customers that we're working with kind of enabling what's something that was not possible before alloys that were not possible before like titanium or in canal um so yeah some of it was agility and some of it is mostly um enabling new things the last category is cost but most of the early adopters don't care about cost as much i think as we are kind of going into more larger established organizations enter automotive. I think that's another key angle too, where we do not require a die. And that's a huge thing. Um, especially if you're thinking about aftermarket parts, right? You know, we were talking with, with when the automotive OEM, and you're, you're familiar with this as well. Um, Department of Transportation requires OEMs to support 10 years. After the vehicle's out, 10 years of support. That means you either have to, I think about a lot of these parts are stamp parts. So you either have to have inventory of these stamp parts. So think about inventory of car doors, right? Huge space. Or keep the dies and every once in a while switch out the production lines to make some more spare parts. Um, either way, it's a very expensive operation. You know, I went to uh, an automotive OEM and their stamping facility, one third of the facility was just die storage. It was just giant dies, right? Um, so, so there are like, you can imagine cost is also a huge factor there. Um, getting rid of these facilities, these storages, these inventory costs and create parts on demand can be a huge cost saver. Um, but I think that would be like the next generation of our customers. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. I like I like that parallel. I've worked in the automotive industry, so I definitely understand and uh, feel those pain points. I like the idea you're speaking around service. Like I think that makes a lot of sense. A lot of the service warehousing costs are what actually, you know, in the long run actually tallies up the total cost of a vehicle program is you know, having to maintain all these, the, either the stock of the dies or all these parts. Um, I'd be interested in understanding this. This kind of leads me to our next question is like, what's the end? What's the end goal? What, how big do you see this getting? What's, you know, not in terms of maybe not in terms of dollars, but you know, in terms of scope, in terms of significance, can you explain to us what the total addressable market is? What does it look like once Machina reached ma maximum potential? Is it just sheet forming? And in what industries do you see it, you know, the world being impacted by the, the technology yeah. you're developing? So starting from like a smallest set today, let's say sheet forming, it's still a very big business. Even if we stay with low volumes, like I said, big, the total sheet forming market is around $250 billion industry. Um, but a big portion of that is larger volumes, right? You know, F-150s and Honda Civics and Model Ys of the world. Um, but then if you look at even on the volumes below 1,000 parts per design, like lower volumes, we're looking at around $20 billion industry that the alternative is still stamping and hydroforming some dye based technique. So that's that's where we can obviously have a lot of impact. So like $20 billion market that we have very direct impact today. But as we talked about today, our goal is to really build the next generation of manufacturing platforms. Can we add trimming? Can we add welding, joining, surface finishing to this? And really move toward something that can not only do higher volume so that we can kind of get closer to the $250 billion market, but also like expand in the process, right? Do other processes. Can you do joining? Can you do surface finishing, right? Um, so, and then once you start thinking about, I mean, the total manufacturing market, I don't know, it's 
50, 60 trillion dollar market, right? Like, so there's there's a huge impact there. Um, and I think we have to do it. I think if you think about manufacturing, I mean, I'm thinking about size is one thing, but I think for us to be able to build the next generation of things we want to build, we have to get more flexible. Like, um, you know, today, you know, if it takes five years to iterate on a car program, right? Like, you know, go from one version to the next. That is very limiting in terms of innovation, right? You need to be also be very sure that a lot of people are going to buy that, which makes a lot of people less risk averse, averse, right? So really, I think this way of thinking, can we make every process in manufacturing more agile? And it might be us, it might be other people. I think there's probably going to be consolidation of different technologies that come together. But I think the whole manufacturing industry will change with this new paradigm of more software-defined, less hardware-specific kind of processes. And I think we need to move there. And that's the only way we can kind of increase the speed of uh, innovation. Yeah. In, in one of your interviews, you were, I think it was specifically the F-150, you were talking about the same thing you just said. You know, they make a car for the next five years, they ship the same car, they're not iterating much. And by iterating more on a design, like most engineers probably know, it gets better and better over time. It gets safer, more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously manufacturing is the limiting factor. Right. So you, I, if I'm not mistaken, what you envision is that with this more dynamic manufacturing approach, everything will get better like yep. the end products will get better. And that's the high level goal that you're shooting for. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah exactly. I think the end products get better. The speed, if the speed of innovation increases, the end product gets better. The cost goes lower. We talked about, like for example, supporting, hmm. right? We talked about automotive storing these dies and these archaic giant, giant pieces of tooling that they have to store for supporting it. Even the cost comes lower. Um, somebody who comes out of a school with excitement, you know, mechanical engineering degree, like be like, I can actually take it apart from testing to production from my home. I don't need to go work for somebody who can afford a factory. I can go on a portal, upload my design, get it built, and then use the same technology to build thousands of it, right? If there's a need for it, right? So this is something already happened to the software industry. I think you can see the parallels right. where like somebody could come up with an, with an app from its home, from their home, build it, and then use AWS infrastructure to massively scale it, um, or Azure data centers to massively scale it. Um, but we don't have that for manufacturing. Like you build one part, it's really a pain in the ass to make the first one, and then scaling it, then you need billions of dollars, right? You know, we talk about like, um, you know, I feel for some of these manufacturers. I'm Rivian, you know, they they and and they're a great company. I love the car. But they're, they're dealing with the impossible manufacturing limitations and kudos to, to them, right? Like, you know, building a factory, they have to build a factory that can support like hundreds of thousands of vehicles, but they cannot from day one jump to hundred thousands of vehicles, right? So they have to slowly move there. And you see how much, like, you know, then they have to deal with this kind of very expensive factory and they're going through it and it's a fantastic thing they're doing. So I, I really admire that. But what if it was easier, like, you know, for the next generation, right, to do these things? I'm happy you brought that up. We saw your tweet to uh, Rivian. You're like, these guys have a plant. It can do 150,000 cars. Like having technology like this would really help them out right, right now. Right. So um, I was going to mention, but happy to hear uh, you brought it up. One thing I was going to say, when I was talking to Daniel, I'm like, you know, with 3D printing, which is one of the things that I've been most excited about during my lifetime mm -hmm. when it comes to manufacturing, probably the only thing to be honest right. with you until this, um, we see it. In academia, like we had it in classrooms, I have a 3D printer at home that I like to mess around with. You know, mechanical engineer, I like the CAD. But then you see services like Zometry having it, and then companies also having it when they need to iterate. How do your how do you see your solution playing into that? Do you see it being something that like someone can just have in their home at some scale, or do you see it just being something that the end consumer, that is another factory, is buying and setting up like other heavy machinery? Yeah, um, I think. The latter is probably more impactful, right? Being able to have it in production, production setting and manufacturer setting. I think with 3D printing, it's nice for the hobbyist to have it at home. I mean, obviously, like they can have plastic printers, but the moment you want to do metal printing, then it's, it's just tougher. Um, you know, some of these sheets require a lot of force. Right. So it might be tough to make it a desktop version of it. Um, but I'm sure at some point, you know, people, people will attempt doing that. I think, but I think... The future will probably look like, and this might take a while, will look like how basically data centers operate. Like you don't have to have the machine at home. 
there's a software portal you go to, similar to how Zometry operates, but then there's a technology behind it. Gotcha. It's not just like, you know, they're not just like being a dealer and get your geometry and find some, some technology, some shop that can do it. But there's a portal you can go in there, upload your design, get guided through how to make it manufacturable and say, okay, I want 20 of these in, in LA, in Hawthorne by next day. The right facility, get programmed to do those 20 parts and send it to you. I think that's 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 the future that I think I envision as opposed to this machine being everywhere. Um, I think there's going to be these like facilities that will have these machines. That makes sense. Yeah. No. Um, I was going to say, you know, you, you seem like a very hands-on guy. Like we talked about your background, everything you did at school, SpaceX. Now, at Machina, you're CEO. And I'm guessing you're doing less hands-on work than ever before. Being someone who, you know, is very passionate about doing the work and someone who I'm guessing as a CEO, your role is more organizational now. How has that impacted you? Are, are you still, I don't know, enjoying your day to day, or are you? It's tough to find the balance of like, yeah, I want to touch something question. right now. No, it's a good question. I, I I still try to stay very close to manufacturing. I think it's very important because like, the core of a product still is very technical product. Like you know, I think as a, even as a CEO, I need to really understand what are the core technical challenges people have. Um, because we still kind of like working very collaboratively with our customers, with our investors to really understand what are the technical challenges and how can we resolve them uh, to get to the final goal. Um, but yes, you know, I spent all last year kind of fundraising, right? So it, it, that's like 80% of my time now. Um, I think there are interesting challenges. I think, like I said, like always was interested in solving the problem, most important problem for to move the project forward. So I right. can I can get excited about it still. And I love talking about it to investors and customers. So that's that's fine. But yeah, no, there's like you have to scratch that itch every once in a while. Like, you know, I, I need to, you know, I still try to do, you know, we have these weekly, daily stand-ups that engineering team talk about challenge. I try to attend every other one. Um, so I still, I'm, I'm in the know. But, you know, probably now I'm like mostly talking about things that don't make sense and they know more. <laughs> but uh but yeah, no, I try to stay in touch. But yeah, no, it's, it's a tough balance. You're right. Like you kind of start, you'd be like, you know, I wanted to start this company to kind of learn to do this with robots that I was used to do with hand. But now you're like, but now I'm just on phone calls and fundraising. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, yeah. it, it, you got you to get in, in peace with that, I guess. What, what, do you say, what would you say is like your number one priority right now as CEO? Um, CEO is a weird job, right? Um, um, I mean, just... Kind of, we're about to close the fundraise. So I think by the time, hopefully you guys put this out, we're done. Uh, so that's something too uh, exclusive. I don't think I've told anybody <laughs> else. Um, so I've been busy doing fundraising for the past few months. Um, and it was a tough year. It was a very tough year. Um, you know, there's a lot of economical challenges and people were very scared of deploying yeah. capital, especially to hardware intensive companies. Um, and uh, so that has been most, but I think... Um, so that has been till now. I think now I'm kind of shifting more toward working with our marquee customers um, to make sure that our solution makes sense for them long term. But I think as a CEO, you, you always have to find out what is the most important problem for your team and kind of help there, right? So, and that has been the case. So I think it kind of keeps changing. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, we, we have some community questions. That I want to, is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I think that's a good thing to jump into. So in episode 118 of our podcast, we shared our digestion of all the cool stuff that Machina is doing and shared it with our community. Um, coming up to this interview, we shared with them, hey, we're we get, going to get to talk with Ed. Everyone was really excited. We got a bunch of submissions and questions. We picked a couple. If you've got some time that we'd like to run through with you, um, I think it'd be really cool to involve the folks that have listened to the podcast, are engaged in the community, and also now get to be a part of this recording of this interview as well, if that's okay with you. Yeah, no, I'm excited to hear what they have. All um, right, so uh, we had Guzzi who said, when you meet with business owners, how do you identify like which one of their processes makes sense to be automated in this fashion? And how do you help them like come up with the ROI? Because you know they care mostly about cost. And then kind of like as a final point on both of those together. How do you finally sell them on it? You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. I think it just kind of goes to the core of the sales process, right? I think I, I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's no different than customers than like selling to investors. You need to really find something that's of a strategic importance for that customer, right? Cost is obviously one thing. Mm -hmm. Some people might be like really being measured against how fast can they deliver, 
right? Mm -hmm. And the speed of iteration, right? I think a lot of initial meetings around that, really understanding, okay, this is what we can do, but like most most importantly, like just listen to the customer and figure out what is it, what is the main problem they have? Um, so, you know, there are certain th certain things that we have identified that we can help with the customer, but again, at the end of the day, it's a conversation, right? Gotcha. It's really just like being able to listen and not talk too much in the meeting, let, let make sure the customer does most of the talking and telling you what is it that they need. Um, and uh, find the right champion, right decision maker involved that really understands the value of a product, can help you integrate it in their in their in their system, right? Awesome. Um, it's a generic answer, but I think no, it's a good one. You know, just let them vent, and then uh, once they tell you about the worries they yes. have with manufacturing, find the find the one that that's the best match. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if it's not a match, help them find the what is them who's a match, right? Yeah, you yeah. know, you know, we work with a lot of other startups and other manufacturing companies. We're like, okay, yeah, I, I can't help you with that. But this company that does surface finishing, maybe you want to talk to them. Or this company who does integration, robotic integration, maybe you should talk to them, right? So I think it's back. a good segue to the question we got from Gianluca, another one of our listeners who said, um, understanding that there's been really complex and rapidly changing opinions around automation versus um, giving people jobs in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time, like a really intense labor shortage for s certain craftsmen are... are you feeling any of those overall pressures changing your sales process? You've been at this for now, what, over four or five years now. Have mm -hmm. you seen that change over the last five years? Yeah, I think what ended up COVID kind of like shifted the dynamic significantly. I think people start having a lot of supply chain challenges and hiring problems, right? Um, so intensify. It was like a lot of wind in our sale um, after COVID. And then also on the defense and the national security um, uh, um, kind of stage Ukraine happened and the threat of China so now DOD cares more about like how fast I can fix my planes if, if I had to get get into a conflict um, so there are like a couple of wins in our sale uh, that, that has changed one nice thing I think about our technology is at least as of today we're not really replacing labor right you know if you think about tradition this is done with stamping process it almost required the same amount of labor um, but we're getting rid of those expensive, dumb dies that you have to make, right? So we're basically making the process a little bit more efficient, the machinery more efficient, um, which is a nice place to be from my perspective. Not, 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 not to, you know, kind of talk down on the folks who are like removing labor. I think that's that's just great too because there's a lot of um, labor shortage today, and people actually like cannot find the right people for mm -hmm. the job, and so like you have to automate it. Um, but I think in our specific case, we are mostly focused on the kind of making the traditional equipment, the same metal that goes into a die, can you make it go into a robot? And then the robot is more flexible, yeah. right? No. And it can do more things. I like what you're saying there. It's not um, automation versus labor. It's kind of this like new generation technology versus the constraints that, you know, if I think back even to the beginning of this interview, you said like you're really, really interested in hardware. But one of the things that frustrated you was all the constraints around how things can and can't be made. And then I saw that theme again in SpaceX, right? How wide can we make Falcon 9, et cetera? Um, does that resonate with you? Do you feel like you're kind of bringing this agility that you've seen and loved in software and in computer engineering and bringing that to real life in manufacturing? Yeah. And I think, yeah, no, exactly. Exactly what you said. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to remove jobs, right? You're just going to make systems more efficient. Right, um, and that's that's what I think that the piece of automation discussions that's missing is that like not all automation is removing jobs. Some of them are just complementary, just complementary and better ways, faster ways to make things. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, we have a question from Sydney that says, you know, you guys are building this very novel system. What would you say is most important at this stage? Is it building the perfect team or, or the perfect product? Um, it's always it starts with the team. I think if you don't get the team right, the product is always not going to be right. Uh, so yeah, definitely the team is the most important thing. We're still expanding. You know, we're gonna we are doubling our size in the next year. Um, so huge focus on there, making sure we're getting the right people um, and matches our values. Um, but then you know from there, you know you need to also have the right process for building the product, right? You know, make sure it's something that. I think there's two, something that customer wants, but also I think there's an added challenge in the manufacturing world is that something, because traditionally it's very CapEx intensive, you also need to find a way 
to fund yourself and sustain yourself to get to the point where this product scales, yeah. which is kind of the, a little bit of added constraint to compare to some other, some other like more less more software centric kind of solutions right you still have to be very creative about your go-to-market strategy to make sure you can make money in the interim right um yeah but but yeah, it starts from people people is the core yeah you know we, when we were doing the tour earlier today um we were talking to jessica employee number eight like we're like what's your favorite part about working here and she's like i it's just amazing People are so creative. They have an idea on a board and then they just do it. There's there's no like, we can't do it. They just figure out a way to do it. And I remember in one of your interviews, you were saying you consider like your most important job is making believers out of people, including your employees. So it really seems like you've done a really good job of instilling that belief that what we're doing here is amazing. Yeah. And they've really bought into that mission. Yeah. Mission comes first. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if people are not, if they don't have ownership into what you're building and they feel like they're not directly contributing to it. You know, if they think of it just as a job, like it's very hard to build something. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we also like to think of ourselves as members of the community. So some Fantastic. final questions. Uh, selfishly for me, yeah. we're, we love to learn about names. Why Machina? Why did you choose Machina? Um, good question. Actually, we had a different name. We had, we, we <laughs> initially we, our name was Cyberpunk Lab. And it just sounded too punkish. For the, <laughs> too cyberpunkish. Too cyberpunkish. <laughs> um, so, so Machina, I think it was like it sounded like a you know it was like start of a machine. I wanted to be something that's like you know just you know it's very simple and it's just the basic element. So machine. Um, there were some pop culture references to Machina. So you know some, uh, some of the things that we liked as a team. So we kind of took machine and 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 turned it into Machina uh, as awesome. a simple name. I think long term probably. Hopefully, like we can drop labs and stick with Machina, but um, yeah. So nothing, nothing too crazy about it. But I think it was just a simple name that we all liked. It's kind of interesting roots, yeah. 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 And uh, another thing for me, being Iranian, you have an Iranian background. Yeah. Um, the art of metal forming actually goes back like thousands of years in yep. Iran and stuff like that. Do you ever think about that? Like maybe subconsciously, there's like a way of you like keeping that legacy and that engineering alive with what you're doing here today. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, like, there's a lot of like, you know, in Farsi they call it mesgeri, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's like basically art of forming copper, right? There's a lot of like cutlery and like bowls and pans and pans and things like that that they used to make with with that. Um, I think, I mean, essentially we're doing with robots what what you know sheet shapers were doing with that with that kind of incrementally hammering it into shape. Um, yeah, no, I think I do think of manufacturing as an art. Um, Right, um, it's probably one of the first crafts that humans came up with, like mm -hmm. you know, kind of like making tools and things that they can use. Um, so yeah, and I think that 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 portion is also very strong for me. You know, that's awesome. I think it just that's that's what brings soul to our work. It's like you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of doing some form of a craftsmanship, right? And and it is art, right? Even if, and that's what I like about a robot. I don't know if you, people look at it. Sometimes there are these errors that are very inaccurate and the robot kind of like maybe the, the control loop is mistuned and start like hammering the part in a weird way. Actually, it's kind of nice to watch because that's when those defects are like where you'll be like, oh, that that's almost like, you know, an artist did it, yeah. right? There's some imperfections in there. Um, um, so yeah, I think looking at our process, I think you get that kind of the same feel of like a craftsman hammering the the, 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 the the sheet of metal as opposed to stamping seems very industrial. Something that's some level, it's soulless. At yeah. some level, I probably like have bias against it. I'm like, this just <laughs> looks ugly, right? You know, let's just form it, form it incrementally into shape. It's just much more organic, artistic process, right? No, oh, I, I agree. I said I've been in the automotive industry. I've been in a bunch of press shops. I've seen stamping happening. I've seen high pressure die casting right. happening. It's really chaotic. It's really scary. It's really industrial. And then when we came here, we were looking with Verboten and you know we got. Uh, Jessica gave us earplugs. She's like, if anything's loud, let us know. You can put these earplugs in. And we went down there and I was like, nothing's loud. This is beautiful. This is quiet. This is like You're just staring watching, at it. It's like watching two robots do a beautiful dance. And yeah. it, it is, it does remind me of like watching an artist do their work. I said, for about the only thing I need is some classical music playing in the background. <laughs> yes. to like watch these robots dance along to it. I, I think I really love the parallel you drew there. It's like you've you've emulated the artists, you've emulated the crafts, the craft people, not necessarily these huge industrial machines. Um, I, I like the, 
the future that you're building here where yeah. it, it is quiet, it is safer, and it is much more fun to go up and watch anyway. Yep, I agree. Totally. I will say one question from my end, again, personally, selfishly being a part of the community, um, I feel like I see a lot of parallels between my educational background. Um, I also took my way through school, um, kept stopping through classes to go take a bunch of internships, did seven internships by the time I was done and said, hey, got to go back and finish. Um, It's always been a goal of mine to at some point choose a problem, bite off a problem in the world that's big enough for me to go off and start my own company. I'm wondering what, at what point in your mind you drew the parallel from like, hey, I'm going to go work for someone else. I'm going to go work for SpaceX. I'm going to go work for, you know, all these additive companies, computer companies, right? You've been at Microsoft, Google, et cetera. At what point did you say like, hey, it's time for me to spread my wings and do my own thing? Were there any precipitating factors or at some point where you're like, now I just need to find a problem that's big enough to solve? Um, no, I think the problem just came to me. Like, you know, it was, I never thought about it as in like, oh, I need to leave to do something. It was more like, the problems came up and during the work that I was doing with bigger companies because they, they were doing exciting work. And I was like, well, I'm really excited about this. That's how I you know, got into 3D printing. I was like, I really want to be excited, excited about 3D printing. Who's doing it, right? And then ended up joining a 3D printing company. But with this process, I was like, well, I'm really excited about like really creating that platform and kind of bring robotic craftsmanship alive. And I was like, nobody's really doing it. And that's when I thought, okay, well, we should, we should start this, right? So for me, it was like more, I think the moment where I realized nobody else is working on this and it's a very important problem to somebody, even if not me, somebody needs to solve it, right? I think that was the trigger for me, right? And then try to figure out how to do it. I think that's a really um, valuable call to action for me and for all the makers and engineers who listen to our podcast and are part of this community, right? If you're really passionate about solving a problem and no one's out there doing it, but you know it's an important problem to the world, it's probably a good signal that you should go out and start and do something on your own because that's your your opportunity to forge something in a new space to solve a big problem that no one else yeah. is solving in the world. Absolutely. I think the point you brought up is just make sure it's a very big problem because the way you approach it the first time might not be the right way. But like the, if the problem is big enough and you think somebody needs to solve it and nobody's solving it, and then you will find a way to do it and you'll find the right people, meet the right people, you know. And, and you ended up doing it. But, to clarify, yeah. you're saying make sure that problem is actually big and not just big in your head at that moment. <laughs> yes, like big enough, like you were like, okay, the world needs to solve this problem. Um, you know, and then you're not like necessarily starting with a solution. I'd be like, I'm really excited about, you know, forming sheets with robots. That's not how we started. We were like, okay, we need to really have a better flexible way to form sheets. Yeah. Right. And then start thinking about what are the different ways we can do that, right? Um, yes. Awesome. I think we're at an awesome spot to wrap up. We we mentioned it before. Our catchphrase for the podcast is like, we're trying to find the secret sauce. What's what's the secret ingredient behind these cool technology companies, what they're doing? Um, at a personal level for you, yeah. though, with the experience that you've had, um, if, if someone's trying to build their own recipe for success, their own secret sauce, what are the kind of things that you would say um, are things that people should look out for? Maybe things that you did that were a mistake. What's, what's the... Um, overarching lesson from your experience building Machina, um, being a Relativity, SpaceX, Google, et cetera. What, what's the overarching lesson from your experience that you can give to the community when they're going out and trying to solve their own big problems in the world? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously we talk about secret sauce as in like, you know, what is this company secret sauce? We talk about AI, robotics. But I think on a personal level, I think, you know, it's a cliche, but it's about breadth of curiosity, right? I think, I think, I do think truly curiosity and innovation come from the place of combining things that were previously seemingly unrelated. And the way you can do that is just like learn a lot about different things. Um, especially in the realms of hardware, um, now it's very primed to connect different pieces, material science, computer, mechanical, robotics. If you start learning from all, with all those pieces, I think you have a much better bigger chance of like finding something that truly can solve a problem and it draws from all those fields so i would say like you know i think the key thing on a personal level is to stay curious and learn as much outside of your field as you can i think it's actually scary because when i grow up and this is a kind of a little bit of an iranian persian culture is that they really instill in you you need to be an expert in one thing like go become a doctor or a lawyer or a engineer that go gets a phd and really like knows one thing really well. 
I actually think in order to start companies is the opposite of that, right? You need to know one thing well, but you need to know like 10 other things that are adjacent to it. And that's how you can kind of like become creative. So, and it's not a regular advice you get in the education system because they all want you to just go as deep as you can, which I'm like, no, 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 just learn as much possible. Increase your breadth. Uh, definitely learn one thing really well, but also increase your breadth. Oh, that's, I love that. Yeah, um, that, yeah, it's encouraging to us because we find ourselves, you know, dabbling in different technical, you know, technical realms, trying to understand as much as we can. That's part of why we created the podcast, right? Yeah. Is to be able to look at all technology and be able to create something of value to the world that allowed us to explore our yep. broad curiosity. So I appreciate that advice to us personally, and then I'm sure um, all the makers and engineers and folks that are part of our community will appreciate that as well. Yeah, no, thank you for the podcast. I'm a big fan, constantly listening to it. Uh, and you guys are doing a fantastic job. Awesome, man. Thank yeah. you for your time. Really appreciate it. I will just say before we call it quits and everything, it, is there a place that you'd like people to find you online or is there anything, a call to action, so to speak, that we can share with our team, even if it's just go follow Maki on Instagram right. or something like that? What, what's the best way the team can find you, support you, um, you know, be a cheerleader for you and Machina moving forward. Yeah, we're, we're, I mean, obviously people can go to our website, machinalabs.ai. We're also on like, you know, regular social media platforms like LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram are the main things we're on. Um, but I think most important thing is, you know, we're still expanding our team. So if people want to get involved with robotic side, with material science side, uh, manufacturing as a, as, as a whole, building software stack, um, we are hiring across all those different verticals. Um, so definitely go to mockinglabs.ai slash careers. And uh, yeah, we're, we're excited to hear from you and work with you if, if, if you're interested. We can even link it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah we'll do it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. <laughs>